Okay, hello, hello, and welcome back to, as we take a look at our epistle reading here for this particular weekend. Um, the First Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 to 10. I love both of Paul's letters to the Thessalonians, but especially the first letter because it's so rich. Um, and as, as we'll hear tomorrow, there's a connection to the Old Testament reading as well from this past Sunday, where in the chapter prior to the reading in the Old Testament reading, the good Lord talks about how, you know, how people so often confuse their own self-made idols as their gods and these kinds of things along the way. And then he reminds them, I'm the one that made you. Okay. So it's not so much what you've made with your hands that you bow down to worship. I'm the one that made you. And, and, and all of these elements attached within the Old Testament, they lead into the way in which Paul writes to the Thessalonians here, where he reminds them that, you know, the gospel comes to us as a gift. And so as we sit there and as we take a look at the way in which people sometimes wrestle, um, build on the gospel which comes to us as a gift. Because in the midst of no matter what we're going through, you know, along the way, it's very easy for us to get distracted and then start building on our worries, our fears, or this and that and the other thing, rather than on the good and gracious action of our Lord, which has come to us through Jesus Christ. That's <clears throat> a beautiful, beautiful introduction, as Paul writes here to the Thessalonians, where in their case, the issue was is that, you know, somebody had started rumoring along the way because, you know, Jesus is going to return, but people have already died, and what if we've missed it? And then the worries started coming in, combined with all of the different kinds of cultural things where the church was persecuted. People were thrown into jail, put to death, um, executed. Very much the same kind of a thing that we see happening in various parts of the world today. Um, where where Christians are routinely blamed for things that aren't really stuff that they've done, and then they are drummed out of communities, as is happening throughout well, the Middle East and parts of Africa, as well as into India and, and places where, where you know, um, we we hear if you pay attention and if you listen, there's violence against Christians. Mainstream media doesn't pick up on it because that's not the story they want to have people hear. Because you know we want to push Christians down here in our society, but it's happening, always has. And so Paul's words are important for us here today. Let's open with a word of prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, even as Paul wrote this letter to the church in Thessalonica, um, bless us with an open heart and open ears to be able to hear and receive what it is that the, the blessed apostle, the apostle teaches, both not only to comfort and to re-anchor those people in that city in those communities in that gospel message but also as a way to help us to also stand within that very same gift open our ears and our eyes and our hearts not only to hear so that you know we get details but to be able to really rest and be anchored within that gift of christ as he gives it to us all this we pray for in the name of your son our savior jesus christ amen all right Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, okay, 1 Thessalonians. This letter was written by Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, the same Timothy that we get with First and Second Timothy. Paul's letters <clears throat> sometimes are just Paul, but quite often he has someone who's writing as a scribe, and that's likely what Silvanus was doing. And then Timothy was a part of all of this, because Timothy, by this point in time, was kind of following and, and shadowing Paul, because Paul had selected him to take over as Paul got older, and as Paul was facing you know, the end of his life and his ministry, that somebody needed to take over. Over essentially as a an overseer a bishop over the territories and churches that Paul helped to establish and so and this leads into first and second Timothy where Timothy is shadowing Paul so Paul and Timothy are, are involved with this together and as we hear this it's one of these neat realizations that you know as we look at these letters that we always say they're letters of Paul well they are they are but some of them were co-written together with others and um, this becomes one of those wonderful, wonderful senses that we have in the New Testament that there is, the way Paul writes to Timothy, the sense of um, handing on this pattern of sound teaching. Sound doctrine is the word. Sound teaching is the word. You can, you know, both translations are good. Um, as a way to as a way to carry on the ministry and there is that very real sense within our congregations as well from one generation to the next 
that we need to pass on not only the sound teaching, and this, that, that's that continuity which is always anchored and rooted in Scripture. We need, to, we need to grapple with Scripture. We need to grapple with those words that have been handed down, not only from the Old Testament prophets, what Paul writes about as the Scriptures in the New Testament context, but also the eyewitnesses, the eyewitness testimony, which Paul likewise acknowledges when he's writing to the Corinthians saying that which you have received in word as well as in the eyewitness testimonies and we need to hand that down from one generation to the next and that succession needs to be there in everything that we do there's two sides to it one is sometimes you get into this mentality where um, within congregations that we you know younger generations say well that's just what the old people do and I don't know where I fit and so we kind of default on that side where we kind of say well that's that's their thing it's not mine hogwash um, you've been called into the same grace You've been called by the same gospel. You've been built through baptism into the same body in order to be part of that, in order to contribute to that building up of the saints and building up of the church through that being anchored in Christ, in the word. The other side is, is that sometimes, and, you know, um, and, and tomorrow's reading really touches on this, where sometimes we get in our minds that, you know, it's all up to me, and if I don't do this, you know, the ones that have been around forever and a day, or if we don't do it the way that we've always done it and the way that I've always seen it done, okay, the doing of things changes along the way. The gospel and the teaching of what is right and wrong, law and gospel, scripture always needs to stay the same. But sometimes we get so caught up in, um, you know, thinking that we're the only ones that God can work through in order to ensure things will move ahead, that we forget that the good Lord works through lots of people. And here with Paul, Sylvanus, and Timothy, as Timothy prepares to take on that you know, apostolic role of, of being the, the bishop over these churches that, that Paul has established. It, it, those words are very important. So here... As we begin, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and again, um, rich, rich words, grace to you and peace. Um, to the church in Thessalonica, Ecclesia, th those who are called, that's what Ecclesia means, is those who are called out, called out of the world to be in Christ, okay? Um, in God the Father, who... God the Father, Jesus identifies his Father as God, and the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, Lord, sorry to our Je Jehovah Witness friends that keep trying to convince us otherwise. Lord is an Old Testament um, way of referring to, or, or I shouldn't say Old Testament, it's a Judaic way of referring to the name of God, Yahweh. So when Paul writes here, and Peter writes, and all throughout, you know, the various different writings of the New Testament, you have Lord Jesus Christ, it's saying, Jesus is Yahweh. Um, and, and there's different places I can point that out in various ways as well that make it very clear. So here, this, this clear confession that, you know, there's God the Father and there's Jesus, and yes, Paul always brings in the Holy Spirit along the way. But his greeting is, is to those who are called out of the world, not so much that we stop being in the world, but we're called into something brand new. And this is the part that we so often gloss over, that we think that, you know, we're called into a kingdom sometime in the future. No, we're called out of it right now, so that even now, we're, while our feet are here on earth, yes, we serve people with all the strength and the might that the Lord gives us, um, but at the same time, we're called not to be in the world, but in Christ, and that's gospel which is why he begins with grace to you and peace, which is this beautiful, beautiful kind of a um, gospel message. Grace to you, grace from God, which is rooted in not only the grace of God, which surpasses all understanding, the gift of forgiveness that Jesus wins on the cross and gives to us through his means of grace, baptism, communion, in the words, you know, that word of absolution. But grace to you, using the Greek word, where it's almost related to the greeting in general, where it's hierate, hierate, um, grace, um, where, where the, the two are related to one another. Grace to you, and then peace. Well, what about peace? Well, that's the Hebraic way, where you go back to, and how do you greet one another? It's in the word shalom, which means peace. Not in the sense of a lack of war, but 
in terms of being drawn back into a wholeness as a person by God's action. As we hear this, you know, Paul addresses these Christians in Thessalonica who are being harried by all kinds of worries, doubts, and troublesome thoughts where people start saying, well, what about this and what about this and speculating about all of these other things that completely drive them nuts along the way. Um, and he's saying, no, 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 you have been called to grace and peace through the Lord Jesus Christ and by our Heavenly Father. You've been called. Those words in and of themselves are words of gospel. As we move on, <clears throat> okay, and, and here, um, this again is where, as I've been talking about over the last little while, we need to read the scriptures in that sacramental context in which they were there, in the liturgical context. Um, the liturgy didn't arise, you know, somewhere out of nowhere as an ordered way of worshiping. Um, not only the temple had its liturgy okay, in Jerusalem, but also the synagogues had their liturgies and prayer books in the New Testament time period so that there were structured prayers, structured ways of reading the scriptures, structured ways of meditating upon them, structured ways of bringing that out into the day-to-day -day life. And again, remembering how Paul uses words for prayer um, throughout his letters, and, and we discover along the word, way that, you know, and it's not a surprise, the word thanksgiving is not just a general word, the way in which um, far too much of the evangelical world or, or secular society just turns it into this secularized and psychologized notion of make sure you give thanks because it's good for you. Um, there's elements of that which are true, but... Ultimately, this is where you get the word Eucharist, Eucharistia, from. Um, and, and this is where, in the context in which Paul uses this here, we give thanks to God always for all of you. We, who's we? Well, Paul, Silvanus, Timothy. But one of the customs that we find in the early church, and it, it extends throughout the early church, and it continues even in the way in which <clears throat> well, liturgical churches continue to function, is that when we gather before the Lord to receive and celebrate the Lord's Supper, we pray for the whole church. We pray for other Christian communities. We pray for others. And so we give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers. It's not a matter that Paul is saying that we're always sitting there saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And thank you for the Thessalonians. Thank you for the Thessalonians, as though that's what they're doing constantly 24-7. It's that the giving of thanks is that as they're celebrating the Eucharist, Eucharistic prayers, Lord's Supper, they continue to remember all of the churches that they are in connection with, particularly the Thessalonians here. He's reminding them, you haven't been forgotten. God's grace is to you. <clears throat> and that peace through Jesus Christ and where Jesus is celebrated in his presence in the bread and wine, in with and under as we receive him, we give thanks to you for you at this time, mentioning you in our prayers. So he's reminding them along the way that as they gather for their worship there where Paul is, together with those that are gathered, they pray for the Thessalonians in the same way that the Thessalonians received Christ, in the way in which we receive Christ each and every time that we go to the altar and put out our hand and receive the body of Jesus and the blood of Christ in order to eat and drink that gift, that gift of eternal life. So here... We constantly mention you in our prayers, <clears throat> remembering before, sorry, remembering before our God and Father, your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. So faith, um, the way that Paul writes, remember faith. Well, faith, we're saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Okay, but faith is a busy and active thing, and Luther says the same sort of a thing. This is one of those things that, you know, not only um, Lutherans have been criticized about, but it's a good criticism to take to heart. Faith is, not, well, our works don't earn salvation, but faith does not mean that our works don't matter to our neighbor. Okay. And this is where those works come in, not as a way to climb closer into heaven or into some higher ranking in heaven, but as a way to 
um, <clears throat> basically take that which is given and then take the freedom that we have from sin, death, and the devil, and the way in which sin gibbles us up on the outside, and this is where Paul's going in this letter, um, so that we don't get worn down and, and, and you know, tripped up underneath, you know, the various different ties that bind us down as a result of that. So <clears throat> he points out, we give thanks to God for all of you who are called through that gospel of Jesus Christ by that grace, by that shalom, that peace, that wholeness. And, you know, we remember you before our God, not only for the way in which that faith spills out in the works and the labor of love. Notice the labor of love, faith, hope, and love. So faith, hope, and love gifts of God, okay, and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Steadfastness of hope, what is that? We wrestle with that in our own day too. <clears throat> we learn, we say, I know Jesus died for me, but then we don't see how it's all connected. And so we go and chase after groups that will preach, you know, this is Jesus died for your sins, but you know, don't ever actually pronounce the forgiveness of sins. Don't talk about baptism the way scripture does, where we're clothed in Christ, joined with him. Don't ever talk about the Lord's Supper as the way in which Jesus feeds us and comes to be present with us and we receive him time and time and time again for the forgiveness of our sins in order to hold us within that, that, that calling that calling of who we are. Instead, we take a look and say, well, Jesus did this, and we remove all the others and say, well, now what I will have to do, where all of this earthly way of thinking, Old Adam way of thinking, you know, Old Testament way of thinking about all the things I have to do, even though the Old Testament does teach we're saved by grace, not by works as well. Ah, where do we go? No, we build with the gift, <clears throat> and we need the fullness of the gift. And so, for we know, brothers, loved by God, that he who, our Lord Jesus Christ, has chosen you, how do we know? Because our gospel, not because of all the things that you've done, no, gospel, forgiveness, grace, because our gospel came to you not only in word, okay, not only with the words and the proclamation, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. Now, I know Pentecostals will say, see, you've got to speak in tongues. Paul isn't saying that. That's reading into the text. No. The gospel came through the word and then produced that faith and that hope and that love. That love that spurs on the works. With full conviction so that when you heard that, you received it and you were anchored in that hope. Okay. All right, so the way he's building in the letter, he's going to say, what happened to that hope? Because the gift came to you. It's a gift. It came to you through the word. Okay, you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. So he's saying, you know, take a look at our own lives, okay? And you became imitators of us for the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. So, even though Paul suffered many things, not only as he went around and preached and then was stoned and was tossed out of communities and all of these kinds of things, and then ended up getting tossed into jail when we get to Philippians and at the end of his life, he says, you know, you saw our afflictions, and even in your afflictions, you received that same word with hope. anchored you in that hope all because of Jesus Christ what he's done came as gospel as gift okay so he's saying he's going back to that saying what's happening okay because even in those afflictions you received it and it was well confirmed in you all right how as a gift so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia that's that area um, that, that, that in the surrounding areas so you know, your example of that receiving of faith, you know, how that gift sunk right into you. Others looked at that and they marveled, okay? It's not saying they marveled at your good works and all of these sorts of things and how really, really on fire you are for the Lord, but instead he says they marveled at the work of the word and the gospel, the way it was received. He's talking reception at this time, okay? And here's where we go and move along. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, 
but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. So basically, um, faith, in the same way that God's word produces what it says it's going to produce, you know, good Old Testament and gospel kind of an image, the word is the seed, the word is Christ. Christ, the word made flesh, the word made flesh given and received not only in words, but sacramentally, okay? All of this produced the fruit that God intended in your lives, and others saw that and rejoiced and learned through that. This leads back to where Paul begins, because what do we receive? Faith, hope, and love. And as we reflect upon ourselves, what happens to our faith when we get so distracted by other things? Or the hope that we have in Christ? It dries up very quickly when we forget faith and forget Christ and forget the gift. Okay? And that becomes that important element that Paul is anchoring them back into where he reminds them right from the beginning. You were called out, the church, those called out in grace, to rest in grace and peace all through Jesus Christ. And I give thanks to God for, for you. Every liturgy, every service, we give thanks to God. We remember you in our prayers. Everyone else in the surrounding area acknowledged that, and they saw that. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Now, we run into this tomorrow <clears throat> with idols um, not mentioned in the Old Testament text as we're reading through it, but it shows up in the ta chapter before, and I mentioned already, where, um, you know, the good Lord talking to the people of Israel who had been scattered um, into foreign countries, and here Cyrus, this pa Persian king, basically the Lord picks him and uses him in order to bring the people back home. Um, it's the Lord's doing. It's not something that they've done by their might. But in the midst of it, you know, along the way, it's sort of like what happens to us when we don't stay connected to the church and so often becomes part of the way in which our society works. We want to tear down the specifics of a religious community, particularly Bible-believing Christians. And those Christians that actually say that these things that Jesus talks about, sacraments and those things are true, will write it off as superstition because, you know, goodness, we're so more, much more advanced nowadays that we don't need those things it's kind of a weird sort of a thing where we build on rationalism rather than the word of god in the midst of all of this but as we listen to all of this along the way instead we substitute what god says and where he's going to give with other things and we create our own idols and sometimes those idols are you know various different ways of anchoring in, in our, our spiritual lives by i know lots and therefore since i know lots that must make me holier or i feel really really chipper and really good and so those feelings are the things that really define in my spiritual life and we can go into all kinds of other things but it's not just that you take a look at society and there's um well to use the use the image of the people of israel at the foot of mount sinai all kinds of sacred calves that aren't god but become these social things within our society that people say these things are the ones that we must treat as sacred or you can't touch them rather than saying Really? You know, golden calf seemed good to the people of Israel at the time, but it wasn't God. They substituted that for the true and living God. <sighs> what are the idols that our society holds before us? And then also, what are the idols that we tend to carry around falling into? Not as a way to say that, you know, we need to be always scared of idols, but the way that Paul basically holds this up and he says you know everybody recognized that gift of faith how the holy spirit worked in you so that you turned away from these different false forms of worship false forms of righteousness false forms of making yourself right with god um false forms of you know pursuing what you think might be godliness okay by just chasing after the crowd that's never been the case and instead, basically pointing out that the good old Holy Spirit did that work of leading us in repentance, doing that repentance, returning us 
to the mercy of God in Christ Jesus. That's what the word repentance is. From the Hebrew language, shuv, it's to return or to turn back. Um, metanoia to, in the Greek language, it's a changing and orientation of the core of who you are, the noose, the core of who you are, so that you're turned away from all of the things that lead us astray back to the clear gift and the word of God. Okay, um, That is a huge element which points to not only a change in attitude or a change of what we chase after, that the Holy Spirit works in order to call us back from all the time. And it's not a matter of saying once you have a one-time conversion event and ta-da, and then everything's good after that. It's a continuous calling that happens through the Word so that because we continuously stumble. Okay? We never get to the point where we say inside, where we can never say that I'm, I'm there based on this, that, and the other thing. It's because of Christ and the Word. That's why we need to hold on to Christ and the Word. So here, as we move along, basically he says, you know, what you received and you were called out of through the Word and the Word of the Gospel, the Word of Christ, the Word of forgiveness, you received that hope and that spilled over in works of love and labor towards all of the other people and everybody rejoiced in that because the Gospel was not only being poured into your lives, but it was also overflowing and spilling into all of these sorts of things so that, you know, everyone heard about how you're leaving behind all of these different false forms of worship, true physical idols during that day. We sometimes pride ourselves ourselves that we don't have physical idols that we bow down to it's not the physicality of it are we searching for the Lord in the places where he says he's going to put himself or are we creating other idols along the way and most of our idols today are more or less hidden but and as he goes on and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come Okay, so here, basically, he's pointing out, through the gospel call, they started this. And the Holy Spirit, who began this good work, who, from our Lord, who brings it to completion, the way that we hear in the, the letter to Jude, um, you know, here he goes on, points out that it's not simply a matter of, you know, one-time thing, conversion, but instead, it's a continuous thing where we have hope that, well, cuts through all of the different ways in which we get down on ourselves, okay? And instead, we keep our eyes on Jesus, who will come again as we wait for the time that he comes, who was raised from the dead, and who will deliver us not only from sin, death, and the devil, the way that we have it already, with that gift of forgiveness, but in the fullness of God's wrath to come, and that wrath which is not intended <clears throat> for people per se. It was intended for the devil and all of his servants along the way, the demons, but those who follow and build on something other than that open door of Christ end up being left out. That baptismal connection, Jesus our refuge and strength, becomes so important because as we get to the end of the letter, this is this whole connection. It's not rapture theology and those who are in the air and we will be there with him. It's baptismal theology because how do we get to be there in Christ? It's through baptism. We're baptized into Christ, clothed in him, all of these kinds of things. We're joined with his body so that when Jesus appears, well, those who have died already or are hidden in Christ will be there visibly for us, and we will be there too, is what Paul says, because we are where? In Christ. But here, <clears throat> as we get to the end of our reading for today, it's that gospel calling that he begins with these verses so beautifully to anchor them in as he starts to address this whole thing. Jesus is still coming. Okay, you haven't missed it. <clears throat> you will know as he unfolds that, as it moves along through the letter. Don't allow, you know, the worries, the thoughts, you know, all of our, our crazy emotions to drive us nuts. Don't go chasing after those things as though they had a greater reality than the gift of the gospel that God presents to us in his word. Use the word that gift, that gift by which you are church, ecclesia, those called out through Jesus Christ by grace and into peace, by which you receive faith, and that gift of hope, hope which endures to eternal life, and then the way it spills over in you know, loving service to those around us. As we hear these words for us today, um, you know, how much do we 
get complacent because yeah, 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 yeah. or how much do we allow ourselves to be cooked within the the crazy of crazy media and the anxiety of the world around us based on wars and rumors of wars how much do we allow ourselves to be sidetracked from that calling um, and, and from that calling not only to rest in Christ and hold on to Christ as he comes to us you know, in the same way that Paul says, as we gather around our Lord who calls us in the way that he comes to us in the Eucharist here, I remember you in my prayers, um, where we're all gathered, we're called to be gathered around that same Jesus. You know, how often do we allow ourselves to be distracted from that by this, that, and the other thing? And then the way we heard last week with you, or with the parable, all those who are invited to the great wedding feast. You know, it's the big feast. You know, it's not just the future, it's the feast that our Lord gives us. The way that we sing in our Lutheran liturgy books, one of the, the hymns of praise, this is the feast of victory for our God. You know, this, the Lord's Supper, where we are gathered together with angels, archangels, and all the company of heaven. Are we going to be like the ones that say, yeah, I've been invited, but not now. I've got mixed priorities. I've got other things. I'm too busy. Da, 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 da. So that like the foolish virgins, when it comes time, you know, that other parable that Jesus says about the bridegroom's gone off. And so you've got the seven wise virgins and the seven foolish ones where the seven wise ones are there and they've got their lamps trimmed and they're waiting and they're all filled with oil, oil being an image of the Holy Spirit and God's mercy because oil and lion sounds like a liaison and Greek, which eleison means mercy and elion means oil and so you've got all of this sense that they their lamps are trimmed by, with mercy and then the flames from that mercy the gift of the holy spirit comes as a gift of mercy so the holy spirit comes first with that gift of forgiveness and mercy it's all got one package whereas the other ones say well they didn't prepare and so and then they're waiting and they're waiting and then the bridegroom comes along the way and the ones that are there with the trimmed lamps the ones that have mercy okay grace mercy and peace be to you from god our father and our lord jesus christ mercy given in the word and in the sacraments the ones that are filled and nurtured by it they're welcomed in and the others he says i don't know you and go that call is for us today and this is where he anchors the thessalonians the same words are needed for us today anchor yourself in not Jesus and grace in an abstract sense but in the very concrete sense where he calls us together calls us out to be one body one church through baptism to be in Christ to feed and nourish us with that same grace so that we learn to rest in that and have hope from that Yes, the constant struggle that we have is instead of being turned in on ourselves to then live that love of Christ to our neighbors as well. The Lord be with you and we'll keep going next week as we keep reading through this letter of First Thessalonians. Okay, bye for now.